go ahead and be seated, I'm going to read Psalm chapter 113 before we pray for the offering. Psalm 113 says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, the Lord's name is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto the Lord our God, who dwelleth on high? who humbleth himself to behold the things that are in heaven and in the earth. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. He maketh the barren woman to keep house, and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. And David is showing us his attitude, and, and often uh, even says those things, not so much that we're to praise the Lord just when we feel like it, but we're to praise the Lord all the time because he is good to us. And he blesses us. He, he raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill. Part of praising and, and, uh, and uh, doing our part to praise the Lord is to give. And, uh, you know, the Bible says God loveth a cheerful giver. It doesn't say God loveth a fearful giver. It says God loveth a cheerful giver. And there are blessings promised in the Bible when we give and we give back to him because we have to recognize everything we have came from him. He allows us to have it. And so we praise the Lord. This is a time where we get to praise the Lord by, by uh, taking some money that we could use otherwise. It's a sacrifice. None of us can, uh, um, but, but we, have to, we have to praise the Lord. And so we have to do that by obeying him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the chance to give and the opportunity to give. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that you give in exchange for this small sacrifice. We know that that's not something we could buy with that equivalent amount of money anywhere else. And God, we can't, uh, we can't do anything to deserve your blessing, and yet you give it to us anyway. And God, I pray that you would help us never to forget that. Help us to praise you when we don't feel like it. Help us to praise you, Lord, even when we are down and out. And then also, Lord, when we are doing well, help us not to forget your blessing. And help us, Lord, always to remember to be obedient to you and to honor you with the first fruits. I pray that you would bless each one here that's giving and that you would bless the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't have a King James Bible after the offering, the ushers will bring you one that you can find in the box. Would you please take your Bible and turn to Hosea chapter 12? I know.
that may take a few moments. One of those minor prophets we don't often refer to back there toward the back of the Old Testament. And if you need to, do not be embarrassed about looking in. Oh, yes, I'll, just a second. Looking in your index at the front of your Bible to find Hosea. And I was just suddenly reminded <laughs> uh, that twice a month, uh, Brother Hamilton Rodriguez takes our young teens, ages 13, 14, 15, for Smite, our Sunday morning young teen enterprise. Would you please, if you're that age group, follow Brother Rodriguez. Amen. Whoa, what a great group of young teens. Fantastic. Glory to God. Have a good time, with Brother Rodriguez. Please return him in one piece. We need him. All right. Way to go, Alan. I love our front sliders. All strands and Alan, thank you. Hosea chapter 12. Now, let me explain to you about a group of people we're about to encounter here. It's the half-tribe of Ephraim. Jacob... You know, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, Jacob had 12 sons. And those 12 sons became the founders of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob's other name was Israel, given to him by God. And so it's referred to as the 12 tribes of Jacob, or of Israel. You can also think of in terms of the 12 sons of Jacob. And of those sons, the one who be, perhaps became the most prominent early on was Joseph, and God blessed Joseph by giving him two lots, as it were, or two portions in Israel. And he allowed that Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, would each be treated like a full tribe with, with all the advantages and the privileges of a full-fledged tribe of Israel so that when the land was finally conquered, the promised land, and given to the Hebrew people, given to God's people, the uh, Ephraimites got a full portion, like a tribe, and the and Manasseh, those those the, the tribe of Manasseh, the half tribe of Manasseh, they got also land given to them, allotted to them, and so they as if they were a, a tribe unto themselves, and so they received special benefits related to the relationship to Joseph. Now the Ephraimites particularly became great warriors great achievers, and there's much good that comes out of the descendants of Ephraim. But also, there came a point at which they became high-minded, began to look upon themselves as being somewhat above everyone else, and began to do some things to further enhance their position that were offensive to Jehovah and caused a lot, and even to the point that, uh, there came a, a stage where they actually uh, became allies to the enemies of Israel in order to be able to further expand their holdings and to gain more wealth. It, it became a thing like, you know, wherever I can sell myself, you know, wherever I can find the best advantage, that's where I'm going. Whether it's with God's people or the heathen is, is of minor consideration. I just want to make sure that me and mine are well taken care of, whatever the cost to others. So Ephraim was greatly blessed of God, but then was held accountable for how they used and later abused those blessings. Notice in Hosea chapter 12, verse number 1, Ephraim feedeth on wind and followeth after the east wind. Now understand, the east wind in Israel is very similar to the east wind in Southern California. Down there they call it a Santa Ana. And you, you dread hearing that there's a Santa Ana condition developing where the wind normally coming, you know, fresh and cool off the ocean switches direction and comes from the east, hot and arid off the desert. And it just completely changes the, the whole experience being in the, in, in, the, in the intense desert heat, even though you're living so near to the coast. And so uh, that's the sort of thing here. It, same thing in Israel. When the wind would come from the east, instead of from the west and the uh, Mediterranean Sea, when it come from the east, it's coming off that hot Arabian desert and just, just makes for a miserable condition. And so Ephraim speedeth on wind and followeth after the east wind. Just, just a lot of hot air, if you will. Gee, I wonder where we got that expression. Maybe you're looking at it right here. He daily increaseth lies and desolation. In other words... 
he, he advances his cause by lying to people and hurting them. Then it says in verse 1, and they do make a covenant with the Assyrians, arch enemies of the Jewish people, and oil, or in other words, are doing commerce with, oil is carried into Egypt, another enemy, a, a former oppressor of the Jewish people, Egypt. So what we're seeing here are, with the tribe of, of Ephraim, is a poor use of the advantages that were given to them by God. There's no question but that the, the Jewish people have special blessings given to them by God. It, it's recognized universally. That often creates uh, a, a high amount of, of envy and hatred. But nonetheless, God blesses these people, his people, the Jewish people, the chosen people. But in this case, this particular half-tribe of Israel, these Ephraimites use their advantages poorly. They use them to pursue frivolous matters, Think, things that, that had, had little real, real value or interest. They, they, they feed on the wind. They follow after the east wind. They're going after things that when you, when you actually go to, to, to consider what's there, there's nothing there. It's empty. It's, it's dead. There, there's no substance to it. They'll get ahead at any price, even by lies and desolation. And they're willing to compromise with the heathen about them, the Assyrians and the Egyptians, perhaps even while those empires are doing damage to their, their brethren, their fellow Jews, you know, as long as they're being profited, then, then they're gonna continue dealing with these enemies. Now, likewise, I find many Christians who take who make poor use of their advantages in Christ. Now, beloved, I have noticed consistently over the years, God has a way of enhancing a Christian's life in ways that sometimes are so subtle, they're not readily apparent. But, you know, I have found that, you know, just for some instances, I've found that so many times it seems like God gives us beautiful children and incredibly gorgeous grandchildren. I mean, come on, you just got to... I'll show you a few hundred pictures of mine if, 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 you're, if you have any doubt about that. Uh, we, we have, uh, I, I'm often just so elated at, at, at looking at, you know, God's people come across sharp and, and above average. I mean, we may look at each other and, and you know, think, well, I don't, I don't feel like we're anything all that special. But take this group right here lift us up, transport us, drop us down in the middle of the, the downtown mall, and take this group compared to the shoppers, even the ones who are somewhat upper crust, and so many of them come across like a bunch of slobs. And it just seems like our people just, just seem to come across uh, more erect, more self-assured, uh, just, just stronger, brighter personalities. You, you, you ought to sometimes just hang out with our children. You saw, you saw some of our young teens go out there, and you know, 13 to 15, if there's, if there's a, a bunch of kids who are you know, just, just totally out to lunch, that's the age group. And yet even they look really good. I mean, you compare them to what you find coming out of the average junior high school or high school, that's a good-looking group of young people. They, our, our, our kids, they're bright, they're, they're, they're fun. Uh, man, I, I love hanging out with our young people. And, and you, just, you sense there as well an above average intelligence. And I'm not trying to say that our kids are all geniuses and the world's kids, the kids of non-Christians, you know, are a bunch of dunces. I realize there are some incredibly bright kids out there from all different backgrounds. And in fact, one of the traps our kids have got to watch out for is not thinking that they can just kind of, you know, uh, progress on their natural God-given abilities and then expect to compete in a marketplace where there are, there are young people who have grown into adulthood who have geared themselves towards success, have gotten, they, they, you know, not all young people are, are taking the mediocrity of the California public school system and just subsisting on that. Some do take full advantage of honors courses and, and uh, college opportunities and higher education and, and they, have, they have groomed themselves, or perhaps with the help of parents or some other mentor, 
they've been groomed towards success. And our young people, if they're just going to assume, well, you know, I've always been told about how you know, we're above average and et cetera, et cetera, and they face that marketplace without being truly prepared, they could get slaughtered out there and get left behind. So we, we can't just rest on our laurels and just, just make any assumptions. But I'm just saying that, nonetheless, if you take them just, just uh, apples to apples, just, just you know, Christian kids, non-Christian kids, our, our kids come across really well. There's just, there's, there's a, seem, just seems to be significant intelligence and brightness and joy and, and, and a sweet spirit. And, you know, some of our, of our senior saints who've been around uh, different places around the, in, in the world and even in various churches around this area, they, they'll come to me and say, I can't believe the quality of the children of our church and our teenagers overall. It's just, it's just really remarkable. And, and I praise God for that. But here's the thing. I've also seen our young people take that, say, for example, unusual natural beauty that's not been sullied by, you know, early sexual experience. It's not been ruined by, you know, right from the get-go, already plastering themselves with makeup or piercing themselves or tattooing their flesh. And so they get out into the world and suddenly, man, they come across as so different than the average girl or the average guy. They become a very hot commodity. And I mean that in the proper sense. You see, use the word hot and all people get all kinds of weird notions today but but I mean but they become a desirable commodity man when, when, when you when a 20 year old guy meets a 20 year old woman who's a virgin man versus the ones you just to hang out with you know that's that's used goods already in their early 20s and you can tell it man that's that's something that's going to become highly sought after and some of our young people fall into the trap of, of being flattered by all this attention. Being, being you know, just, just men, uh, they, they come out of a church where we try to be very careful about how we interact between genders. They go out in the world and these guys are tripping over each other and drooling over themselves, you know, to get at our girls. And it's, it, it's, just, it's just, to them, it's just so amazing to be suddenly looked upon as something. In church, they're just ordinary. That's just how our girls are. They get out in the world and they're considered extraordinary, or our guys, for that matter. And, and, and that's just an example of how we've got to be so careful. God gives us certain advantages. And it, it could be that because of you've not smoked, you've not been involved with alcohol, you've not been involved with drugs, you've not, you've not spent your life jumping from one person's bed to another person's bed. Man, when you hit 40 and 50 and 60 and 70, Man, you're, you're still you're still a lot of a lot of tread on the tire, and you're still doing really well, and it's noticeable. But it also is noticeable by the wrong people who want to take advantage of your advantages, and so we've got to be so careful that we as Christians are not guilty like the Ephraimites of wasting our lives with frivolous pursuits. That it's us feeding on the wind. It's us who are just partaking of a lot of hot air. And we can end up wasting our lives on a bunch of things that mean nothing in the long run. And that's a poor use of your advantage. Or getting ahead at any price. You know, sometimes once, some Christians, when they get a taste of the potential in the world, how much money there really is out there to be made, and suddenly there's something clicks inside them, something changes, they morph into... You know, they go from Dr. Jekyll to Mr. Hyde, and suddenly, man, you wouldn't even hardly recognize what they're like in the workplace or what they're like when they have an aging relative that has some resources behind them. And suddenly, this, this person that was such a dear and sweet and lovely Christian turns into a monster of greed and avarice. Or like the Ephraimites, willing to compromise with the world. Perhaps it's in order to gain more, more friendships, or maybe it's to have more fun. But, but, but so often, they are willing to change their convictions, their standards, their beliefs, to, to more mirror the philosophies of the world, so that they can go along in order to get along 
as opposed to being salt and light in a dark world and being God's peculiar people, which is not easy and it's not comfortable, but it's, it's what we're called to do and called to be. And we ought to embrace being a peculiar people like a Green Beret is peculiar in the Army. He is a cut above, like, like the Marine Corps is within the Navy, like, like this, or the SEAL. <laughs> Or the, oh, 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 I, I touched a nerve there. I'm sorry. Uh, forgive me, Jim. <laughs> or, or the seals among ordinary sailors. They're peculiar. They're, they're a breed set apart. And last time, I, last time I checked, man, a paratrooper wears his wings proudly. Or the fighter pilot. Or the, the, the seal. Or the green beret. Or the, the, perhaps it's recon in the Marine Corps. What, whatever it is that sets them apart, and they will actually strive for that recognition and, and wear it proudly, display it proudly. And forever after, they want to be identified with that. My, my former pastor, Dwight Tomlinson, uh, we, we, we were, my wife and I had a meal with him recently, my, my, my first independent fundamental Baptist preacher. And I said, Brother Tomlinson, you know, it's something that he had mentioned before many years ago, but it finally kind of sunk in. I said, Brother Tomlinson, weren't you, when you were in Vietnam, weren't you a ranger? He goes, yeah. I thought, wow. And that's a very appropriate wow. You know, he was was out there. I mean, he was right out there in in the muck and mire of the jungles and fighting the Viet Cong, you know, one-on-one. It was, uh, it it was, it was, but but forever after, he has that, designation he has that he, it, it, it brings him above his peers in my estimation he was an army ranger he served his country with distinction well why can't we then apply that in the spiritual realm to being God's peculiar people God's cut above God's special forces and and where it and I realize we got to be careful about the word pride and, and, and so forth but but in a, in a proper sense bear it proudly bear it with distinction and I'm not saying that we have to somehow, you know, that get into an attitude of, you know, don't, don't come near me, I am holier than thou. We know that God condemns that attitude in his word. But it ought to be more like, here, I want to work with you, I want to be a blessing to you, I want to lead you to Christ because I've striven to be holy. My holiness is an advantage in me being able to work with you, in me being able to be a blessing to you. So I'm not talking about Holiness from a perspective of, of I'm now too good to, to, act, to interact with you, but holiness that, which equips me to better serve you. Verse number two. The Lord also hath a controversy with Judah. That, that's a broader Jewish kingdom of Judah. And will punish Jacob according to his ways. So that's all the 12 tribes of Jacob, or Israel we might call it. According to his doings, will he recompense him? Or according to his doings, the way that Israel at large has not properly followed Jehovah's directives, his commands, because of that, the Lord says, you have done me harm, you've done me injury, you've insulted my name, I will pay you back, or I will recompense you accordingly. And that is the result of using one's advantages poorly, you're setting yourself up for punishment I will the Lord will punish Jacob according to his ways now brother you can whitewash that if you desire and say well you know I don't know if I'm comfortable with the idea of a Christian being punished by God call it what you will call it chastisement call it chastening call it trials call it adversity call it affliction if you will but it still equates the same thing God is punishing a wayward child. Now with my children, we used corporal discipline, corporal flesh, discipline, all right? And, uh, but but, you know, that stinkweed by any other name still still (laughs) was hard for them. It still stinks because, beloved, you know, they would tell you, it still equates to one thing, I got spanked, I got paddled. I mean, they, they, they made it sound good. It was called corporal discipline, but it was still, it was still punishment. It was still painful. 
It, 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 it still hurt. It was spanking. And so it is with, with, with us as Christians. Man, you, you can try to give it a different name, a different label if you want to, but it boils down to one thing. When we do disservice to our Savior, when we have, have, have brought offense to the Heavenly Father, He, as a good Father, is going to deal with us accordingly. And it, what it boils down to is we will be punished. Now, God may let the world do the punishing, and He may let other people do the punishing, but it's still going to boil down to punishment. Now, the source of our advantages is found in verse number 3. He, speaking of Jacob or Israel, he took his brother by the heel in the womb. Now, now God is commending this. There's something about the nature of Jacob that even in his mother's womb, he reached out and took hold of the heel of his brother Esau and wouldn't let go. And it marked him, for, it marked him as a distinct ever since. And it says in verse number 3, And by his strength, he had power with God. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. Even the Lord God of hosts, the Lord is his memorial. Now, beloved, this tells us that our advantages come from the Lord. It was the Lord who took note of something in the nature of Jacob that appealed to him. And so he worked with Jacob, though Jacob's very name means trickster, though Jacob did some things that were very displeasing to the Lord, nonetheless, nonetheless overall, the Lord just, just seemed to have special favor with Jacob, more so than he did with, with others, certainly more so than he did with Esau. Esau despised his birthright, whereas Jacob treasured it, and he he grasped it. He, he, he made it a goal to get the birthright, and he got it. He made it his goal to get the blessing, and he got it. He made it a goal to enhance his, his, his wealth and holdings, and he got it. And it just seemed like God somehow responded very positively to a man who would exert his strength and power to lay hold on things and just refuse to let go, and that was very appealing to God. And God chose to bless Jacob for this nature, this attitude, this spirit of his. And I just want you to just want to underline for you and me, beloved, that our advantages come from the Lord. It wasn't just simply Jacob by his own connivance becoming the great man we know of today. That we still remember thousands of years after his peers and contemporaries are long since forgotten in the dustbin of history. Jacob is still substantial to us because God chose to make him a patriarch. God chose that he would become the father of 12 sons, who would become the 12 tribes of Israel. That, that even the name Israel itself is a name of Jacob applied to all his descendants and a land in the world is set aside today named after him, Israel. And Israel will have significance right on through the end of days. God chose to bless Jacob and our advantages too come from the Lord. Now, what we do with those benefits determines the extent and duration of future blessings. Now, I want you to notice this fact about Jacob in the second half of verse 3. It says, by his strength, he had power with God. By his strength, he had power with, with God. This is a reference back to Genesis 32, where we're told that Jacob used his strength. And I realize a man's strength is of nothing compared to God's strength. But God had appeared to him in the form of an angel in the night. And Jacob somehow recognized this as a, as a heavenly being. I don't know if if at first he saw this as God, though later he marveled he, was, he lived because he said, I have seen God and lived. And it was an amazing thing to him. But he, what he did initially, though, know there was something about this man far above the norm. And, and a, a heavenly being of some sort 
And he, and he did come across as being an angel of the Lord, and I don't think it's because there was big wings on his back, by the way. I, don't, I, don't, I think that's, that's a silly notion, you know, winged angels. But, uh, but he, he saw him as something special, and he laid hold on him and refused to let him go. And I know God, if God wanted to, he could have flicked him off like a fly. But God chose to wrestle with Jacob through that, that night. And only at the end, as the, as the day break, did God kind of flip him off? Oh, man, our language now is so corrupt. It's hard to say much of anything without getting in some kind of trouble. God threw him off, <laughs> threw, threw him off himself, and, and it put his, his thigh out of joint. And he for, forever after, he had a limp as a result of that encounter with God that night. But he got the blessing he sought from God because at that moment of his life, he was vulnerable. At that moment, he had just left Laban, his father-in-law, and, and all the security of being in that environment. And he was on his way back to home territory. But there was Esau, his offended old, uh, twin brother, who was determined to, it made it very clear that the next time I see Jacob, I'm going to kill him. And here he is heading right for the, for the jaws of the enemy. And he needed God. And he laid hold on that angel which turned out to be the Lord in that form, and refused to let him go. And the Lord had respect to that. By his strength, he had power with God. He got hold of God and refused to let go, and God had respect for that. God has respect for the Christian that lays hold on God and refuses to let go. I, in, in seeking of God a blessing. And it was there that the Lord changed Jacob's name to Israel, proclaiming, For as a prince, thou hast power with God and with man, and hast prevailed. You, Jacob, you, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this win because you have... There, God responds to the man who just won't let go. To the woman who works her way through the crowd and touches the hem of, her, of, of his garment. And though she be a Syrophoenician by nation, still God chooses to, to, to give her her healing. To the woman who comes to him and she acknowledges, I'm just a Gentile dog, but, but only you can heal my daughter. And the Lord grants that request and allows her daughter to be raised up. To, 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 the, to those who get hold of God and cling to him and refuse to let go, there comes a point at which the Lord says, you've had power with God. You've had power with men. You have prevailed. Thus it may be that as a result of clinging to Christ and faithfully serving him, we may hear words comparable to, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men then hast prevailed. A prime motivator for many of us who dedicated our lives to serving our Lord Jesus Christ is that we may one day hear these precious words from his lips. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. We know that, we know that gratification that it's going to be deferred until the judgment seat of Christ. But we rest content knowing full well that I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered in the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. And so as we love him and keep his commandments, we know that we may not see the full benefit of it all in this life, but it is coming. It's coming because he's promised it so, and he keeps his word. The proper use of your advantages is found in verse number six. Verse number six. Therefore, turn thou to thy God. Keep mercy and judgment and wait on thy God continually. Your blessings should draw you closer to the Lord and cause you to want to serve him because that's what it means to wait on thy God continually. It's not just go sit on a chair, twiddle your thumbs and like, all right, I'm, I'm praying, and I'm just waiting for something to happen. It means that while we wait, we serve. We are, we, are, we are like the waiter. 
who waits upon the customer, hovering around, just looking for any little thing he can do to make the experience that much more enjoyable of dining in that restaurant. And, and he makes himself invaluable to the customer and to the restaurateur. And so it ought to be with us that we're waiting, as we're waiting on God by serving the Lord actively. And I think a good place to serve him is right here in your local church. Now let's take a moment. I know I'm going to panic all of you that are veterans of New Hope Baptist Church because you know if I say let's now pray, it means that was the introduction. And the clock is worrying against us mightily. But I will do my best to give you what I have for you today and not keep you an extraordinary amount of time. So let's do to go, Lord, in prayer. Father, having laid that as a foundation, would you please bless the balance of your word? God, help me to say everything needs to be said. Say it well. Say it with the power of the Holy Spirit, but also, Lord, in a timely fashion. Lord, and we do pray that you'll please bless the effort in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, please, would you advance a little bit further in your Bible to Amos chapter 6. Amos chapter 6. Now, beloved, I want to emphasize that it is the same God in the Old Testament that we find in the New Testament. Today's Christians almost act as if the Old Testament is somehow no longer applicable to us and we're just focused on the New Testament. It's as if, well, the way that God was, the way God, the way God presented himself, the, that, that somehow it, it all changed at Calvary and, 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 and all of a sudden the past no longer has any significance for the future or for the present. And I, and I, I must say to you that nothing can be further from the, tr from the truth. We learn what Jesus expects of the New Testament Christian by studying what Jehovah expected of the Old Testament Jew. And we learn how Jesus responds to the faithful New Testament Christian as well as how, how he reacts to the erring New Testament Christian by studying how Jehovah responded to the faithful Old, Old Testament Jew and how he reacted to the erring Old Testament Jew. The specifics of our Christian duties differ dramatically from those of our Hebrew spiritual predecessors, but there are also strong similarities in the way we are to pro approach divine service. For example, by God's grace, we no longer perform bloody sacrifices because Jesus took care of that as the Lamb of God was taken away the sins of the world, and his was the ultimate sacrifice, never needing to be repeated. It's over and done. We have no need of an altar, no need of lambs and goats and rams and, and bullocks and oxen. Beloved, the blood has been shed for, that pays for our sins. But in a, in a similar fashion, we are to come daily, just as the Old Testament priests came daily to offer their sacrifices, we're to come daily to the throne of grace and offer up the sweet-smelling savor of prayer. And that's our sacrifice. It's not fun. It eats up that, you know, what we consider to be valuable time. It, 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 if we're not careful, it, it can become, it can seem to us as boring. But then consider it just sacrifice. And by the way, in making the sacrifice, you'll come to a point where you find you love it. And more than that, you need it. You're addicted to prayer. Like Sam Gipp, our evangelist friend, who says, I am addicted to the prayers of, of the saints. Because without it, with my physical condition, man, I, I'm a goner. I've got to have God's people praying for me. Well, I'm to the point now where two, you know, as husband and father, as pastor, as just a man of God, I am addicted to prayer. I've got to have it every day. Now, likewise, Jehovah may have dealt differently with Old Testament Israel than he does with New Testament saints, but we must remember he does still, still respond and he does still react. For example, I, I've not known yet of a time where God sent fiery serpents in the midst of the congregation in a New Testament church like he did with the church of the wilderness under Moses in the book of Numbers. And I'm glad for that. Man, I, although it could well become the impetus we've all looked for for revival. You know, just, just snakes popping up and biting complaining Christians and putting them out of our misery 
could be a blessing for all. I, I don't know. But, but, but he does not do it that way anymore. He does not split the ground asunder and swallow people and their families and their households wholly into the heart of the earth. He, he, he doesn't do things quite like he did, but he does still respond. He does still react. And we've got, we, we have to realize now it's through fiery afflictions, if not through fiery serpents. While he does not promise us an earthly homeland as he did the Jews, he hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So, d different approach, but same God. And very similar ways that he works with us as he did with the Old Testament Jew. That's why it is very wise for us to study the Old Testament. We're told about the methods Jehovah used with the Hebrews of old, and we're told, now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Those stories are preserved for us because these people are in samples to us. It's like, look, be a David, get the blessings of a David. But be a David in the area of lust, adultery, and murder, and be prepared to pay fourfold as he did. Same God. But rather than me going out and discovering by trial and error how God reacts to, to, to gross sin, I'd rather study David or many other Bible characters and learn from their mistakes and from the, the smart things that they did as well. The Jews are examples for us to study that we may emulate their well-doing and avoid their transgressions. With that understanding, we read with interest Amos 6, verse 1. Amos 6, 1. Woe to them that, that are at ease in Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came! Exclamation point. This is a heavy woe upon God's people. Now you look at this, and do we have to work too, you know, real hard to get an application to us as New Testament Christians? Allow me, if you will, to paraphrase verse 1 as I would see it for us. Woe to them that are, that are at ease in their spiritual lives, satisfied with the blessings they have already received, and are now content to quietly subsist until their translation, or if you prefer, until the rapture. Woe to them that trust in their mountaintop experiences of the past and in their comfortable church attendance of the, of the present and are no longer interested in attempting to do great things for me. Woe to such Christians. Verse number 13. Verse 13. Ye rejoice in a thing of naught. Now what does naught mean? Nothing. Ye rejoice in something that's actually nothing, which say... Have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? See, Pastor, what are these horns? Horns depict strongholds or authorities, or if you will, great achievements, goals accomplished. Amos is scolding his people for allowing themselves to be distracted from addressing the important things in their lives because they have accomplished enough already in their own estimation. They're not interested in rousing themselves to do yet more for Jehovah, although Israel had never taken all the land promised to them by the Lord. And yet they never, once they were comfortable, they quit. That's all they were interested in. This is a poignant description of today's average Christian who rejoices in things that, are, that in reality are nothing. Things that have no eternal value. I speak, for example, of those who rejoiced more to see the Giants win the World Series than they do to see souls saved. Now, I'm not saying you can't have the enjoyment of having a, a, a sports team and excited that they win their particular championship, but don't let that become more valuable to you than hearing of another soul saved. I got the blessed phone call yesterday from David Aguilar about one in the afternoon, and he said he was all excited. There's a lady I just, I just visited, or tried to visit, in Petaluma a couple days ago. She wasn't home, left some materials at the door. They apparently have a, a young person in their home that has uh, 
goes to junior college and had the little junior college placard on the car window in the driveway, so I left a chick track under the windshield wiper <laughs> for that young, young, young adult. Anyway, brother, coincidentally, brother Aguilar goes to the same house in Petaluma yesterday, concerned about the same lady who's visited us from time to time over the years, and, but never really settled down. And he, and he talked to the woman, and he met her husband, and led her husband to Christ. Right there in the living room. And the wife is ecstatic. Her husband's going to be with her in heaven. He, he got saved yesterday. And Brother Aguilar is so excited. We've known these people now for some years. And, and I've met the husband at the door. You know, It's been quite a while, but years ago I met him at the door. And so I know, I know who he is. And I'm excited for David. And you know what? That should thrill our souls. You know, if you, as a member of this church, you, you, you have a part in that. It, it, it's what we do individually also touches upon us collectively. And we need, we need, to, we need to get excited about that. I'm, I'm condemning those who rejoice more in finding a great deal on some worthless trinket than in doing a great deal for the Savior. I grieve over brethren who rejoice more in silly escapades with their favorite cultural celebrities than in the spiritual exploits of good soldiers of Jesus Christ. You, 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 know, you know how some guys are with, it, it's, it's like, if you don't want to get hurt, don't get between them and the sports page of the newspaper. And I'm sure now it's the internet and all that, but, but, the, but don't spoil my illustration. So, and they are avidly want to keep up on scores and who are the big names now and, and, who's, and who's accomplishing what. And, and man, there's, you know, who's been bought for, by what team and who's, you know, who's been drafted and they're, they're reading it, reading it, reading it, which is fine, guys. If you're at least that enthused about reading our missionary letters we give you on Wednesday nights or that I send you over the internet or through by email, if you're just avidly going, Wow, I wonder what's happening in Papua New Guinea. I've got an investment there. I wonder what God's doing in Thailand through Brother Shemesh. I wonder what God's doing in China through Brother Miracle. I wonder, wonder what God's doing, uh, you know, look at, looking at our work around the world. I wonder what God's doing in that prison through Brother Pierce, because we have a part in that. And that's my, that's my spiritual portfolio you're talking about. Those, that's, my, that's my investment in eternity. Now that phrase in verse 13, have we not taken to us horns by our own strength, equates to bragging about one's accomplishments when you know that all your gifts and abilities and thus all your achievements came to you as a gift of God. Man, you know, I, I don't mind you telling us how, how then you scored the big deal or you, 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 you got the great promotion or you got the big raise. Man, glory to God, we are excited with you about that. As long as you make sure that God gets his glory. We're, we're fond of saying in our, in our public prayers, and we'll be sure to give you the glory. How often do we really do that? When the Hebrews displayed such a level of disappointing self-satisfaction and disgusting self-adulation, it moved Jehovah to declare in verse 14, but behold, I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord God of hosts. And they shall afflict you from the entering in of Hamath into the river of the wilderness. God prompted the enemies of Israel to strip away the precious advantages that had been enjoyed by the Jews as God's chosen people. So may we as Christians expect to lose our blessings if we fail to appreciate the true source from which they are derived and serve the giver of our bounty. I don't mean just simply a, and I don't mean to demean our giving of thanks, but there's ought to be something more than just a lame, oh, you know, thanks God. There ought to be, Lord, I am so moved by how you're blessing me and my spouse and my family and the things I'm seeing happening in our church. God, what more can I now do for you? Thank you, Lord. Now what more can I do for you? You've done so much for me. God, who provided your gains in life, can also remove them, sometimes in a most brutally abrupt and even violent fashion. 
as Jehovah warned the Hebrew half-tribe of Ephraim in Hosea 12, according to his doings will he, the Lord, recompense him. According to Ephraim's doings will the Lord recompense Ephraim. In other words, Ephraim has proven with all his great advantages, proved to be one big disappointment. And God said, and I will pay you back. You have abused your privileges, even to the point of hurting your brethren for your own advantage. Lying, cheating, conniving with the enemies of your people, just so your, your, your nest is a little better feathered. God says, I'm, I'm going to pay you back for this. I'm going to get even with you on this. Now, I'd like to please give you an, an illustration. And it involves someone in our church, a relative of someone in our church. I'm giving this illustration with permission. I'm being vague with some details because I, uh, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody or shame anybody. You know, it's one thing to do it broadly, like, you know, just in, in, taking the shot, blam, with a shotgun. And if a pellet hits you, hey, you know, if the shoe fits, wear it if I step on your toes. But not if I'm singling you out and, and, and attacking you, and it's very obvious to all I'm speaking to you. Uh, speaking of someone who's not in our church, the, the, the relative is in our church. And a few of you will probably figure things out just, just by some of the, the details that I do give. But, but, I, but the person that's in our church understands and is okay with me sharing this. We, we've heard recently of this husband-wife related to someone in our church. And man, they're skipping merrily through life. Both have great jobs. Both doing really well. But the person in our church would tell you, as this person has from the beginning, that what breaks the heart of our member is that these precious relatives have only a little interest in the things of God. Yeah, they belong to a local evangelical church, but that's really a very small portion of their lives. Most of their, t you know, for the vast majority of their time, their energy, their money is all about them. And so on, on they go through life. Great incomes, setting aside great retirement, uh, man, really doing well as far as this world's concerned, but miserly when it comes to the things of God. So time goes by. Now, the husband has cancer. And that's a very sad thing. The husband cannot work. The husband needs a lot of care. Now, the wife is left in a situation still making a six-figure income. But all their spending was based on two big incomes. And after all these years of putting God kind of on the back, you know, the, the, kind of putting him on the shelf, putting him somewhat out of mind, a very minor part of their lives, it kind of came a day when, when God allowed cancer in the life of the husband. And now the wife is finding, my, though my income is huge compared to most people, it, it won't pay for all of our credit, all of our debt, plus the care of my husband, the added care of my husband. Tremendous pressure now is, is, is upon them. Now, by God's grace, the husband is rediscovering the Lord. You say, why would God allow that to happen? Well, maybe that's it right you know, they're now burning through all that money they set aside for themselves for the retirement. Now they're burning through it. Medical bills. I told the person in our church, who reminds me so much of my dad, who set aside for himself a good early retirement so he could travel the, the country with my mom. And they'd have a great time. And three weeks after he retired, tender age of 56 found out he had lung cancer and a short time after died and like the man who said it, you know, filled, filled his barns and said hey soul take thy knees, eat, drink and be merry the Lord said hey this soul 
that this night thy soul will be required of thee, then whose will all these things be? Now, what, now, now where do you go with, with it from here? So for this couple that we're referring to, for so many years, God has just been a minor part. And suddenly, God says, well, we can change those circumstances and give you a whole different set of priorities. Meanwhile, the member of our church has for decades been heavily invested in the things of God. Been a blessing every church has ever belonged to. And is a blessing in a mighty way here. And you'd look and say, man, that person lives fairly simply. Yeah, but you ain't seen the end of it yet. You haven't seen what's been laid aside, laid up in heaven. Hey, Jesus talked about laying up your treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt and thieves don't break through and steal. Not even the IRS. They can't get through to those treasures. They're laid up forever. Now, we are now exactly halfway through the notes. And Pastor goes, because I think you got enough to go on there. And beyond this would be would be overkill. But I just want to challenge you. you. God gives you strength. Talents, abilities, gifts, if you will. And he's watching to see what we're doing with what he's given to us. And he has a way of, we utilize his blessings, and he gives us additional. He gives us more ways in which we can serve him. He expands our horizons. But when we start hoarding, and it's all for me, it's for me, it's mine. Don't touch it. God, get your hands off that. You, it's mine. I did it, I did it, it's mine. God says, what are you talking about? I give you your strength, I give you your mind, I give you your ability, everything you've got is, is, comes from me. Can I please have some back? No, no! Well, maybe a little bit. But this is mine. God has a way of saying, well, we can change this circumstance. and We can make you, bring you back to where you are utterly dependent upon me because you have nothing else to lean on anymore. As we bow our heads, bow our heads, please, and close our eyes. Oh, the Lord had respect for Jacob. I know Jacob had serious character flaws. But I'll say this much for Jacob. He was tenacious. Once he got hold, he would not let go. He didn't let go of his brother's heel at birth. He didn't let go when he had opportunity to secure the... the uh, the birthright, he got it. When he got the opportunity to get his bless, the blessing of their father, he, he got it. It should have been Esau's. But, hey, Jacob, Jacob was, was just not willing to let go. When he encountered God in the form of an angel, he, he latched on and would not let go. And God, God, God let him cling. And then God blessed him for it. And all through his life, one thing about Jacob, he just wouldn't quit. Just didn't let go. And God respected that strength, respected that tenacity. But now, how about how much better it would be if you invested that back into the things of God? The blessings, the advantages, the gifts he's given to you. Don't be like Ephraim. Don't, don't just continue to look at how you can just enhance your own position in life. You'll end up feeding on wind, yea, even the hot east wind. You'll find out in the long run it, it turns into nothing. But rather, I wonder if you would instead look at investing in things eternal and using your advantages and finding ways that are pleasing to God. And Lord Jesus, I do pray that you'll please help our people see that we only get, we only get strength for just so many years and we need to do what we're going to do quickly we only have sound minds for so long we only have certain abilities for a limited amount of time and it's critical that we take what you give us and use it wisely use it well 
use it, Lord, in investing right back into the work of God. Our time, our treasure, our talents given back to you. And Lord, I realize we, we, we invest in our spouses, we invest in our children, and grandchildren, and our friends. And I, re I realize all that. And we don't want to take any of that away from anybody. But we also are just simply challenging that we also find ways to involve ourselves and invest ourselves in the work of God and be a more well-rounded Christian. And I pray that some in this room will find that their true fulfillment and their great delight in life comes from serving Christ by serving others and getting involved in the work here at the Gospel Lighthouse that we call New Hope Baptist Church. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help us to make wiser decisions based upon your blessings to us. Beloved, as we stand together, if you do not yet have Jesus as your Savior, and you don't know for sure you'd go to heaven when you die, would you please allow us to show you? I wonder if you would be willing to come right from where you're, wherever you're sitting. Come right to me and say, Pastor, I need to be saved. Please come into my heart, wash away my sins, and take me to heaven when I die. Allow me to show you, if I could, how you can have that home in heaven. If you're here as a Christian, and God's spoken to your heart this morning, you feel so motivated, you're welcome to follow the good example of your brothers and sisters in Christ here at the altar right now. And kneel, or if you cannot physically kneel, stand and speak to the Lord. Whatever he's laid out on your heart, whatever change he wants to make, let it be so. He'll show you what he wants different. You just respond to that prompting of the Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, you're welcome to continue to avail yourself at the altar or to sing along with Brother David Scott in a song of invitation. He'll give us the number. You're welcome to sing along. Hearing hymn number 200, hearing hymn number 203. deck of the sinking Titanic, the band was trying to keep up people's morale by playing the latest tunes, but suddenly it went quiet, the lights had finally gone out, the, the remaining passengers who had not been on the lifeboats knew their doom, and the band struck up the British version, a little bit different tune, but it's the song here, Near My God to Thee. You know, among the, the crowd huddled at the stern of the vessel, watching the waves, the frozen, the, the cold water creeping ever closer to them, was Mr. and Mrs. Astor, the great millionaires of New York City, who had taken this luxury cruise back home from Europe. And they were together, huddled there. And all of a sudden, the ma amassed millions of Mr. Astor meant nothing when it came time to face God. The last verse, there's something to say.
let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all that have come to be part of this ministry here in Sonoma County. Lord, we thank you for the message Pastor brought to us. I pray that each one of us would think on these things and uh, be back in our place as we uh, hear the, the conclusion of that message as well. Lord, we pray that you bless these and we pray that you bring them back safely again tonight at 6 o'clock for our evening service. We pray if there's one here that's struggling in this area of salvation, they're unsure of where they'd go if they were to die today. I pray that today they would trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Help each one of us to strive to be better Christians. Help us to uh, strive to um, come to you for our strength because, Lord, you're able to uh, do mighty things as we saw this morning in, in Sunday school with uh, um, Jehoshaphat. Lord, we praise your name for uh, being able to do mighty things when we trust you and we can just sit back and watch how you are able to uh, protect us and, and take care of us. Lord, we praise your name for that. We pray that, again, you would meet with us this uh, evening in the evening service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.